I want to ask a few questions. Have you ever felt rejected, unloved, abandoned? Has anybody felt like that before? Do you sometimes feel like no one cares about you? Do you sometimes feel alone, lonely, even in the midst of a lot of people? I'm sure a lot of us have felt like that before. So you are not alone. I have felt like that before. And we have read stories in the Bible of people who felt like that before. David, for instance, you remember the story of David? Most of his time, I mean, the Psalms that David wrote, they are very emotional. The Psalms that express the way he must be feeling at different points of time. In Psalm 27, he said, If my father and my mother forsake me, I know you will be there for me. Can you imagine what must be going on in his mind that time? And it's possible, in fact, the likelihood is higher that David was abandoned. David was neglected, even by his own parents. No mention is made about David's mother. The only mention that was made of Jesse in connection to his upbringing was when Samuel went to Jesse's house, his father, to anoint one of his children, a king in Israel. And even the father never thought that that position was fitting, you know, uh, for David. He was at the back side tending the sheep. Nobody remind, remembered him. The prophet had to ask, don't you have any other son? They paraded all the likely candidates except David. Even his father did not think much of him. Terrible he must be. Thank God for God. Let somebody say thank God for God. If you feel unloved, if you feel neglected, if you feel forsaken, God is saying to you today, I am with you. And not only for now, I am with you till the end of age. That is the theme of our message this month. I am with you. And that is found in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. From verse 18 to 20. It's a, it's a passage that is familiar to all of us. Because it was a passing message that Jesus Christ gave to his disciples when he was about to depart from the earth. Matthew chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 18, the New King James Version. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That was the last statement that Jesus Christ made. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Why should we believe Jesus' claim? Because this is not a commandment, this is not an instruction, it is a statement of fact. I am with you. Why should we believe him? We should believe him because his faithfulness is without question. David said in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down, me, me. David experienced the faithfulness of God even where his parents failed him. He said he will prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He said, surely, that was a personal testimony of David. And it is a testimony that all of us can have. The faithfulness of God is without question. God's generosity is perfect. The Bible says he supplies our needs according to his riches, not according to our faithfulness. 
Not according to the offering that we give to him. Not according to how much we serve him. According to his riches. And his riches are unlimited. Hallelujah. God's affection is tender and loving. This same David says so in Psalm 103. He said, it crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. Paul equally said in Galatians 2.20, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. These are testimonies of their personal encounter that made them to know that God is faithful. In Philippians 4.19, he said, he is my God and he will supply all my needs. All of us are fond of saying that. But remember again, this was a testimony of Paul. Hallelujah. The presence of God is permanent. He is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no ending. His acceptance of you and I is also unconditional. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His communication is upbuilding and for our best interest. And of course, his authority is right and true. You cannot question the authority of God. Jesus Christ said, all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And he said, the same power I have given unto you. But let's look at the, 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 the text of today. Particularly the one that says, I am with you always. Even unto the end of the world. Like I said, it's a statement of fact. It is not conditional. It is not a commandment. It is to everyone that knows the presence of God. So the question is, what does it mean to experience the presence of God? How can you have this assurance that Paul had when he said, I know God will supply all my needs? And that has become a cliche among us believers. A cliche that many of us have not really experienced or believed. How can that be your experience when Paul, I mean, when David said that he is my deliverer, my strong tower, my refuge, in him will I trust. And in Psalm 91 that has become so popular of late, you know, towards the end, it's like a conversation held between David and God. He said, because he has known my name, I will deliver him. With long life, I will satisfy him. That is the kind of experience you and I are supposed to have. It shouldn't just be something we read about. When God says, I am going to be with you, we should experience that presence. And how is that going to happen? It will cost us something. <laughs> Hallelujah. Knowing God personally, experiencing him intimately will cost us something. Number one, it may cost you the loss of friends. It may cost you the loss of family. It may cost you the loss of situations. It may cost you the loss of relationship. Because his name is jealous. He doesn't want anyone or anything to take priority over and above him. He wants to be number one. So if you want to experience God intimately, when he says, I will be with you, and it is not just something you are reading about, you know, from a religious book, it is something you know. There's a way that you will know that will give you confidence and assurance wherever you may be. But it will cost you. You may have to forsake <laughs> some friends. You may have to cut off some relationship. You may have to leave certain situations. He said to Abraham, he said, I am going to take you somewhere. He had to depart his family, his known comfort zone. That was a, a a big sacrifice. A big sacrifice. Simply because he's following someone who promised him a place that he has never seen. He didn't even tell him where. How many of us are willing to follow God in such manner? Their intimacy grew so much so that 
God said in Genesis chapter 19, concerning Abraham, he said, I know him. Not only that, Abraham said, or we read about the fact that Abraham knew God. God himself said, I know him. How would God know him? Due to their intimate relationship. Mark, let me read first and foremost Luke chapter 14. The word that God has given to us as our theme this month is a word of comfort. It is a word of encouragement. It is a reminder that we have the richest of all riches, which is the presence of God. Luke chapter 14. I will read verses 25 to 27. He said, Now great multitudes went with him. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That is the cross. Does it mean that you are going to hate them as in hating them? All he's saying that he has to come over and above all relationship. You have to love God beyond the level of love that you may have, either with your spouse or for your children or for your parents. He wants the totality of you. That's why he said the commandments have been reduced to two. The first one, love God with all of your heart, all of your might, and all of your mind. And then he said the second one is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. So, experiencing the presence of God will cost you our time. Mark chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. If you are ready to pay that price, you will know him. And uh, once you know him and you experience him, every other thing will follow. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 3, from verse 13 to 15. And he went up. On the mountain, I call to him those he himself wanted. Has he called you? He called to himself those he himself wanted. And they came to him. And he appointed twelve, and that they might be with him. And that he might send them out to preach. And to have power to heal sicknesses. And to cast out demons. It's a call to separation. He called unto him those he wanted. And they came. When you come to him, you have to remain with him. Because he wants to pour himself into you. He wants to increase in you so that you will decrease. When God increases in you, fear will vanish. Sicknesses will go. You will have hope for tomorrow. You have something better to offer other people other than material things. Because God is a spirit. It will cost you friends, family situation or the loss of relationship. Number two, it will cost you your time. Job 22, 21 that was read during the congressional prayer says, acquaint yourself now with him. To get acquainted with God means to grow in your intimacy. To get familiar. To know him intimately. It means you are spending time in this world because God is a spirit. You won't see him physically. But his word is, is the same as him. He said he has exalted his word over and above himself. So when you spend time in the word of God, I'm telling you, you know, there will be an exchange. Your language will change. Your feelings will change. Your desires will change. Because it will be infusing strength inside of you. Wisdom inside of you. Clarity inside of you. And it will be taking away all those negative energies. I pray that God will help somebody today to make a decision. It is a decision you have to make. Nobody can make it for you. To say, Lord, I'm ready to spend more time with you. Because when you do, see what Job said. He said, acquaint yourself now with him and you will have what? Peace. The reason we don't have peace is because we are trying to figure things out with our own head. Limited knowledge. But when you begin to yield to the Lord in prayer, when you begin to yield and fellowship with him in his word, 
you will see definite changes. Number three, loss of earthly possession. That could happen. We serve a God who does not pretend. He doesn't tell us, you know, things that will only make us to be happy. You know, Matthew, let's look at you. Matthew chapter 19. A young ruler, rich ruler, went to him and asked a question. And he said, when the young man, no, 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 from verse 16. He says, now behold, one came and said to him, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 20, the young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard that, that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Is Jesus condemning having earthly possession? No, he's not. He's the source of all good things. He's the maker of everything that is good. The Bible says all good gifts come from him. And how do we propagate the gospel if you don't have money? But what he's saying is that you have to get your priorities right. And why do you think he asked that young ruler? which began to tell him the commandments, because he knew. He knows all things. He knew what he lacked, and he wanted to be able to let him confront his own need or lack. Because he said, all of these things I have done. Jesus knew that he has done all of these things, except one. And so by the time he confronted him with the need to sell his possession, because he knew that was where his heart is. And I ask you today, where is your heart? Because your heart is what God wants. That is where he wants to occupy. My people say that what is, um, English is so limited. What is important to you is what you will say often. What is important to you? Your heart will be there. Your mind will be there. You talk about it all the time. We only need to stay with you for a while before we discover where your interest is. What is your priority? The Bible says we should set our affections on heaven. We should build our treasures on heaven where thieves, you know, cannot get to. Where is your heart? What do you think about most of the time? That will give you an indication, the position of God in your life. And I pray that today you'll be able to make the necessary adjustment so that you too will experience God and say, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my hope. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my comforter. He is my hiding place. He is my provider. Not because you are reading it from the Bible, but because you have experienced it. That will be your experience in the name of Jesus. Earthly possession is taking, has taken a lot of people away from the presence of God today. That's what they call, you know, rat race. I want to make it. I want to make it. I want to look like this. I want to have like unnecessary competition. Beloved, let, let me remind us, when we die, we're not going to take any of these things away. Nothing. And in heaven, nobody is going to ask you, how many houses did you build? How many possessions were you able to acquire? May the Lord give us understanding in Jesus' name. Finally, I identified another loss. And I believe that is the greatest of the losses. Loss of self-will. Loss of self-will. Let's look at what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 16. I believe we read it earlier. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 24. 
He said, then Jesus said to him, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. He said, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If you lose your life, what does it mean to lose a life? It means you are living in denial. In denial of what, what you consider to be important to you. You have denied and you continue to deny yourself of self-comfort. Personal agenda. Personal ambition. Why? For the sake of Christ. A good example is Paul. He said, I have suffered the loss of all things in exchange for what? For the excellency of the knowledge of God. No wonder he became one of the most famous, I would say, of the apostles. But then, what is your priority? He said it. He said, if you want to keep, ah, no, I can't do it without. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to do this. I have to do that. Just like another rich fellow in the, in the Bible, was it a parable? And he said, oh, look at all my possessions. Ah, my soul. Just begin to rejoice. I will build a big barn, a storage. I will, store up, I will take my gold to, the, to, to where um, robbers cannot get to it. I'll take it to the bank. The Lord said to him, you fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. I believe we don't have such people in our midst today. I believe by the Spirit of God we know that there are better things, you know, to think about, to spend our possessions on rather than acquiring possessions that will perish. I believe there are people who know, you know, that Jesus Christ said, what does it profit a man? If you gain the entire world and you lose your soul, that will not be our portion in Jesus' name. So when you suffer the losses of all these things, what is there for you? What is your gain? What is your benefit? Let's look at it. Number one, Jesus Christ promised us what? He promised us a hundredfold of every loss. Not only here on earth, but also eternal life in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have you given consideration to where you are going to spend eternity? Have you thought about what will happen after you take your last breath? Are you making plans for that? You know, we take insurance policy, you know, to secure. <laughs> it's not our lives we are even securing the lives of the people we are leaving behind. So what happens to you when you leave? Where are you going to spend eternity? Matthew chapter 19. There are benefits. God has not called us to a, a life of just you lose, you lose, you lose. There are lots of benefits. Matthew chapter 19. Again, verses 27 to 30. Matthew chapter 19, verses 27 to 30. It said, Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all. You know, after he saw the response of Jesus to that young ruler, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, shall, what shall we have? We all know that Peter is the outspoken one. So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that is, the regener that is that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, can you see, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Where do you need, uh, you don't need lands in heaven. You don't need, you know, all those things that were listed here in heaven. So, in this world, you would have hundredfolds of whatever you have lost, whether material or otherwise. And above all, when you die, you are going to reign with him. That will be your experience in the name of Jesus. Number two, you are going to have peace. When you have lost your life in order to gain, you know, the life of Christ, you would have peace. John chapter 14, verse 27. John chapter 14. And verse 27, it says, Peace I live with you, 
My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Why are people afraid? Because of lack of peace. Because they don't, they don't experience the continuing presence of God. They don't have that personal knowledge of God that is present. He said, I am with you. You've got to believe it. To believe it, you have to grow in your intimacy with him. You have to understand him. You have to know him. There has to be an exchange. Each time you come before him, he will take your fear away. He will replace it with peace. He will take your sorrow away. He will replace it with joy. He will take away your hopelessness. He will give you hope. He will take your sicknesses away. He will give you health. And so, so many things benefit. There are things you don't even need. He will give them unto you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And number three, assurance of his presence. That is what brought us into all this. Matthew 28, 19 to 20, uh, 18 to 20. I'm not going to repeat it. He said, lo, after giving them the commandment, he said, I am with you always. What better benefit? The assurance that his presence with you. The assurance that he's caring for you. The assurance that all the blessings that he has pronounced, you can lay claim to them and experience them. The assurance that goodness and mercy shall follow you. Not just because you are, you, are, you are just, you know, you are just saying it, but you know. You know that you know that goodness and mercy follow you. You know that he's crowning you with loving kindness and tender mercy. You know that your sins are forgiven. You know that the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sins. You know that he has given you power to thread upon serpents and upon scorpions. You know that it is not only pactors. Who can decree a thing and it shall be established? You know because you have experienced it. In your intimacy with him, he has told you. He has assured you. He has infused you with the boldness, with confidence. He has given you wisdom enough to know what to do and what not to do. Why wouldn't you want any of this? What are you willing to lose? It will cost you something. James, I think James chapter 1 verse 48. James 4, 8. He said, draw near to me, and what? I will draw nigh to you. Shall we rise up on our feet? I am with you always. What will you give in exchange? What, what will you give up in order to experience the power, the prosperity, you know, the provision of God? Because when he's with you, he will protect you. When he's with you, he will keep you safe. When he's with you. Angels will accompany you. What you cannot do, they will do for you. When he's with you, there will be abundant provision. More than anything, you will have peace. What are you willing to give? That is the promise of God. And that is what is reminding us that we have him. We have him. Shall we begin to talk to him? Shall we begin to talk to him? He said, Lo, I am with you. More than ever before, we need the presence of God. Government has failed us. I mean, they, 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 they don't have the answers anymore. You know, they are so, it is so obvious that they are so limited in their knowledge, in their power. Where do you want to put your confidence at such a time like this? Would you rather not follow him? Would you rather not cut time that you waste in unnecessary and unprofitable things and spend time in the word of God? Spend time in the word of God. Spend time in this presence. And say, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to know you. Reveal yourself to me. And God is not cheap to be found. He said, when you seek for me with all of your heart. He knows when you are desperately looking for him. When you seek for me with all of your heart, then you will find me. Are you willing to give that time? Are you willing to give that effort? Talk to the Lord. Talk to him. Tell him that this month, this month, I make up my mind that with your help, with your mercy, yes, I will grow in my intimacy. I will grow in the knowledge of the word. I will grow in my fellowship time with you. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I receive that grace. I receive it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. If what I have said sounded so far-reaching, 
unattainable to you. If it sounded like theory, something that is not possible, I stand here to tell you that it is possible. It is something that I have experienced and it is something that I'm still experiencing and it is the source of the boldness and the confidence that I have. And it is given for everybody. Maybe what you need to do is to rededicate your life to the Lord. Maybe you haven't even accepted him as Lord over your life. Remember I said he's a jealous God. He wants to be the Lord. Maybe you are still saying, no, I can't, I can't fully yield. I still have this and that to do. And maybe perhaps today you are making up your mind that you are forsaking all. You don't have to fully understand what this means. He will show you. He will help you. He will guide you. He will make it easy for you. All he wants is for you to make that decision. Is there anyone who wants to say, Lord, I'm giving you my life today. I'm surrendering my heart unto you. You don't need to look at anybody. Your hand is being raised unto him. And he sees, he knows. If you are that one person, I would like to pray with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. The Bible says where your word is, there is power. Thank you for the deliverance. Thank you for the healing. Thank you for the salvation of souls. Thank you for many more things. Hearts, minds, people who are saying, yes, Lord, I am deciding to forsake all and to, fo to follow you. Thank you, Father, because you will keep them. Thank you because they will begin to know your peace. Thank you because you will take away fear. You will take away all that is giving them concern. You will give them, oh God, beauty in place of ashes. Father, we thank you. For the rest of this week and throughout this month of March, Father, we pray that your hedge of protection will be around each and every one of us, including those who are worshiping online with us in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that every one of us will know you better than ever before. We will carry your presence wherever we go. We will experience your peace. Fear will become a thing of the past in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, precious Father. Glory and honor unto your name. In Jesus' most powerful name, we have prayed.